Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, Italian American Experience Lecture Series, now in our 27th year. Um, so welcome. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are not on the mailing list of the Hofstra Cultural Center, please leave your name and email uh, with my colleagues in the back, Janine Rinaldi and Amy Trotter from the Cultural Center. Uh, the Cultural Center uh, organizes and hosts, uh, I would say, at least 200 cultural events during the academic uh, semester, uh, academic year, right? And a, a lot of times that we do these events, we only do them because we know that we have the logistical support of the cultural center. And so I'd like to thank them and the director, Athelene Collins, who's not here, for their 27 years of helping us make this lecture series a reality. And one of those realities is that we are oftentimes very uh, fortunate in we're being able to bring to campus some really distinguished uh, people. Um, this semester, Professor Ricardo Costa, who teaches Italian here at Hofstra University, I see some, some of his students here, uh, came to us with a proposal to invite uh, not two, actually three, but the third person was a little late, so that's on a different flyer. Uh, three people, Italian Americans, who are involved uh, in the industry of television, film, um, media, uh, who are who have been instrumental in forming a kind of Italian American ethnicity on screen. One of the big debates in academia and also in popular culture is the representation of Italian Americans um, on the screen, in popular culture, um, even on like social media. Uh, and so we thought it would be a good idea to go to people who actually have a hand in creating these images that are oftentimes in front of us. And so uh, this evening, Ricardo Costa has invited Ana Teresa Casho, who, as you can see from the flyer, is a, uh, a writer, playwright involved in television, and probably most famous for her role in General Hospital and uh, All My Children. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Ricardo Costa to take over and do a more formal uh, introduction. And we also, as you see, have a different setup this semester. We thought it would be interesting for Professor Costa to have kind of informal conversation with our guests instead of our guests giving like a formal lecture here and then the Q&A. So that's why you have this like cozy setup here on the stage. Uh, we thought it would be more conducive to have uh, a conversation that way. So let me uh, welcome both Professor uh, Costa and Ana Teresa Casho. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you to the staff that you know, made this one possible. And, um, and um, again, uh, thank you also for you guys to come tonight. I hope uh, you, you know, going to enjoy it and participate. You know, so please feel free to ask questions. You know, Anna, she's here. She's wonderful. Happy to answer. Uh, I guess uh, my first things I like to say about Anna is because you guys are my students of Italian. Is how I met Anna. Uh, so I met Anna teaching her Italian. Uh, I was teaching in a school, and Anna was one of my students. So then, you know, we got to know each you know each other better, and got you know we eventually decided to write together projects. And um, so I say, well, you know, and she's an excellent writer. I mean, superb. You know, when you read what she writes, is really you know your eyes are mesmerized. So uh, Anna has a huge background in uh, TV writing, um, you know, soap operas, but also playwriting as well. Uh, All My Children, General Hospital, As It Were Stearns, and then she can tell you more and more about it. And um, I, I ask Anna, because she's a woman, she's Italian-American, uh, and she's a very well-known, established writer, I, to come here to talk to you guys. I know that some of you are you know, in film and television or want to be in film and television, and uh, she's also a woman, and we know there's some jobs uh, in, uh, all around the world, but mostly like in Europe and the United States, that they're very hard for women, for young women to get to. And uh, you know, because they're mostly mass, you know, male control. And one of that, you know, Business that now has been changing, thankfully, was you know television, you know television and film it was always like kind of in the past controlled by men, 
And, and so I said, okay, well, Anna, come here and tell us a little bit more about your experience when you started, how you started, and what was difficult for you in having a, an Italian last name as well as to be a woman where you like look down because of your craft, because of, you know, because of your gender, or uh, was you know easy and smooth, which I don't think so. But now I leave the you no know, the word to Anna to tell us more about her. I think it's already working. Hello. No. Oh, oh great. <laughs> Can you tell I'm not used to being on the stage? I'm used to being over there. Um, so. Um, I want to start with um, the idea of growing up in an Italian-American family in the 60s when uh, in Northern Virginia, where there were very few other Italians. Um, they, they were, you know, my mother used to complain because she, she couldn't find the groceries that she used to be able to buy in Brooklyn. My parents are, um, all four of my grandparents are from Italy. So my parents are really first generation Italian. and. Um, Growing up in a very waspy area was a little difficult because, well, first of all, nobody knew, knew how to pronounce our last name. And secondly, I really didn't fit in. Um, I wanted to be like the other girls. I wanted, there was a girl I just admired so much, and her name was Sally Reich, and I wanted that to be my name instead <laughs> of Anna Teresa Cascio. And so I took to calling myself Anne because it was less ethnic. And it really wasn't cool to be Italian until The Godfather came out, which is odd because The Godfather, you know, isn't like the best representation of Italians, but suddenly it was like, oh, you're Italian? Oh, wow. And then you could wear like sort of Italian pride t shirts and stuff. Um, and in terms of my writing, um, I think growing up that way in an Italian family shaped every single thing I did. I, I, don't think I've ever written anything without an Italian uh, character in it or an Italian-American character in it. My, one of my earliest successful plays was called Strega, and it was about three generations, uh, an Italian grandmother, uh, her daughter, and then a uh, granddaughter. And it was about how you know, tradition and uh, what you brought from what the grandmother brought from the old country was sort of holding back the the granddaughter, and it's about the death of those traditions, in in a bittersweet way. But uh, um, my I I did a representation of my parents in that play, and I think one of my best moments was when they came to see it, and recognized themselves in it, and recognized that I understood their struggles as being these Brooklyn Italians who had moved to Virginia and were trying to fit in. Um, it was, my mother wanted to assimilate so badly, it was really sad. Um, <laughs> until, until 1972 or 73 when The Godfather came out. And then it was like, I'm Italian! <laughs> so, um, and my parents, just to, to show you what it was like back then, when they were sent to public school in New York, in Brooklyn, their names were changed. My father's name is Modesto, and it was changed to Morris. My mother's name is Bianca, and it was changed to Blanche. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, they had to have special passports and all that stuff. Um, and so, uh, um, wait, what was was there a specific question in there? Yeah, well, it was more like, you know, it was also like, like uh, difficult for you, you know, to get into the industry that you yeah. eventually work for uh, your last name and also for being right. a woman. Okay, so first I'll just get into a tiny bit of history in, in the fact that my parents moved from Brooklyn to Northern Virginia because my father was recruited to be in the CIA. Okay, and the CIA um, had a pocket of Italians who were employed there. Most of them were my relatives. <laughs> okay, so we did have a little community in Northern Virginia of Italians. You know, my godfather, my uncle, um, uh, another cousin, uh, my mother's cousins, two of them, they all worked at the CIA. And the, that's who we would celebrate Christmas with and all that. Um, and, but at, at the CIA, and I worked there too for a while, and my mother worked there her, most of her life. Um, the Italians were not, I can't say they were discriminated against, 
but they were um, not, they were, there was a snobbery against them because they weren't the elite members of the CIA. They weren't the people in charge. They were the grunt workers. They did the printing downstairs. They, they, my father was ahead of uh, cables, which were, you know, were these enormous machines before computers. You know, it was like a sweatshop. Um, my mom was a, a teller at the credit union, and I worked there too, and they would always go, oh yeah, your, your father, he's, yeah, he's over there. You know, he, it's, he wasn't one of the big wigs, for sure. Um, and so uh, I think one of my best moments, because my parents ha had such pride in their CIA work, because it had gotten them from the tenements of Brooklyn to a house in Northern Virginia with a, a half an acre of land and a bunch of oak trees, um, when I, I went to work at the CIA, there was an internship program for kids, uh, for children. Uh, and they asked me to stay, and they would finish paying for my college if I stayed uh, X amount of years after I graduated. And I know how much my father felt beholden to the agency. However, when I said to him, they want me to stay, Dad, uh, he said, you're a writer. You've been writing since you were eight years old. That's what you do. You don't, you don't want to work here. You don't want to do this. You want to write. And I thought, oh, he gets me. He really gets me. I don't think he ever, ever thought in a million years I would earn my living as a professional writer. <laughs> and he, he, he kind of lived long enough to see that happen because I went from being a kind of offbeat playwright here in New York to Hollywood because of my first screenplay sold. Uh, uh, it's called, um, like, uh, Warner Brothers optioned it. And it was called Romeo's Girl. And it was about Italians in Virginia. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so from there, because that sold, I got a lot of other work in Hollywood that was extremely unsatisfying. And I have to mention to the women here, and to the men, it was before Me Too. And I was really young. And uh, I was... Uh, preyed upon. It was like, you f if you flirt with the right people, n we'll give you, you know, ninety thousand dollars for the script. Like, it was awful. It was awful. My agent used to send me lingerie, and this was okay. This was like, oh, yeah. So yeah, George sent me, you know, another nightgown, um, <laughs> and so it was very demoralizing because. And this, I, I went to, I was accepted to Yale Drama School as a playwright. I went there. I had a professor who loved my work, supposedly, thought I was really special, and then made a pass at me. And when I, I was like, are you kidding me? You're like really old. You're <laughs> and he said, do you know who I am? Do you know what I could do for you? And once I blew him off, he just, he never <laughs> paid attention to my work. So was it me? Was it my work? It, you know, these things, you straddle this, this area between believing in yourself and not knowing where anybody's coming from in terms of, of how you write. So it was tough. I, I think, um, you know, I, I had a nice living in California, but it was, it was uh, it's a soulless place, at least for me. It was soulless. And... They, uh, once you take a dime for what I used to think of as my art, it's not your art anymore. It's not even yours anymore. They're paying you, and they're going, change this, do this, change this, change that. And you think, maybe if I change it enough, it'll actually get made. Maybe if I change it enough, you know, I'll be a big success. Uh, so it was, um, there's, uh, there was always that question. And also, the Italian thing, <laughs> for a while, I... Uh, my, I have uh, another master's degree in creative writing, which I got from a little college in Southern Virginia. So I went from Northern Virginia to Southern Virginia, and I, was, I had to supplement my income, so I was working as a cocktail waitress. And people in Southern Virginia would say, what country are you from? Oh. <laughs> I'm from Virginia. <laughs> because of the name and the everything it was different. There was, I was surrounded by... There were a lot of Texans at the school. There was a, it was it's, Southern Virginia is a unique area in terms of the South because it's really Southern. It's shockingly Southern considering it's four hours south of the D.C. area. Um, but uh, have a long time 
It doesn't happen so much anymore where people can make those stereotype jokes about Italians. You know, oh, you're in the mafia. Oh, you know, you must know, you, you, you know, uh, or, or the ethnic, what are now, you know, ethnic slurs back then used to be jokes. They'd, they'd make, uh, you know, or, 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 or the stereotype of you're, you're passionate, you're vengeful, uh, you know, you, you're, you'll get one of your relatives to kill me, those kinds of things. It happened all the time when I was growing up and up until really, I don't know, I'd say 20 years ago, maybe at the most, um, it was okay to make, to make those kinds of like, funny little remarks about your ethnicity. Um, I know it seems kind of difficult to believe this. Or does it seem difficult to believe this now? No, it doesn't. The stereotypes are still sort of floating around there, and people are still feeling be uh, like bold enough to make these remarks if they know them. Do, do you feel like, do you feel like it's good-natured joking or? Uh huh. Um, I get the joke. Mm -hmm. But I understand today, they just get so close. Right. They kind of dress them to the times in which they do things as jokes. Mm -hmm. Or in light of something else that's going on in their life. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I had some relatives um, who lived here in New York. My, see, my dad, you know, and my mom escaped the whole New York traditional Italian milieu. They end up in Virginia where people have different ideas. My father's sister and her husband could not believe that my father would allow me to go away to college without being, to leave their house without being married. They had a daughter exactly my age. She was not allowed to go away to school because that's, that just wasn't done. That's how traditional my generation, that, or my parents' generation was. And that poor cousin, she ended up like in an arranged marriage. It's miserable. Um, and, uh, and so that's how, it, it, it's not that long ago that this was going on here, you know, where, where Italian uh, American daughters did not have any independence. My parents were thought of as, you know, the vanguard. Like, oh God, I can't believe you didn't. You know, it, it just, my, they, w they had expectations that I would like somehow get married and stay in the suburbs and have a traditional life. They, they kind of got used to the fact that that was never going to happen. Um, but as I said, I, I had some really proud moments when they came to see my work. And uh, I just, I loved that. I, and I still now, when I write, I think, would this, would this make my parents proud? Would, would uh, you know, would they, would they get it? Because if they got it, that means everybody else will too. Because <laughs> they were basically, they never, my father never finished high school. So, um, you know, you kind of have to keep that, your audience in mind. Uh, and uh, one, one reason I got into soap was because when I think I was still working in Hollywood and I would go home and my dad was retired and so was my mom. And so they were like, they'd been married for over 50 years and they would be watching a soap opera and they would go, they would be arguing passionately about it. No, she's wrong. No, but she's doing it for her children. No, yeah, no, but it's that, it's still, she's cross, crossing these boundaries. It's not good. And I thought anything that could get, get people involved on that emotional level when they know each other so well can't be all bad. I don't know how any of you feel about soap opera, but it is universally looked down upon by every other writer I know. Um, it, even writers in my union go, oh, eh, you know, that. If I, okay, I have a little volunteer job where a lot of high schoolers come in every, every week to work. It's a soup kitchen. And I, they'll say, you know, well, what, what, did, what did you do? What do you do? And I'd say, I'm a writer. Well, oh, for what? I said, well, I used to write for General Hospital. Oh, not a fan. I'm like, have you ever watched it? Have you? <laughs> have you? Like these little, these kids in high school going, soap opera. Oh, it's so cheesy. That's terrible. Oh. Um, and so the great thing about going from Hollywood to soap opera is that soap opera is run almost entirely by women. It was so refreshing. <laughs> Not to have to have that tension when you walk into a room for either an interview or even you know a story meeting, 
there was nobody there who was, um, you know, thinking terrible things about me. Um, they were probably thinking terrible things about me, but for different reasons. <laughs> so it was fun to be in a room with, with uh, women and gay guys mostly. Um, it was so refreshing and so liberating and really uh, gleeful. I mean, I don't know if any of you are familiar with soaps, there are things like, you know, the, the, um, the evil twins or the mixed up babies or, you know, whatever, you know, that we bring people back from the dead. We, we had, there was a, there was a certain level of hilarity that I really enjoyed. And, and if you, you know, it's just, they're just, soap operas are s just story. It's anybody who's watched a movie and liked the plot, that's what soap opera is, it's plot. It's just story. And, and uh, General Hospital, where I ended my career, I retired about a year and a half ago, um, it, it had a, <laughs> okay, they created a character out of you know a, a godfather out of the godfather's success who uh, was you know a, a, he's you know was a mobster he was a gangster but I think they they made him Greek so that they could sort of avoid <laughs> the Italian stereotype but they used every other stereotype in the book <laughs> hugely successful character he's been on the show since the 90s or maybe even the 80s still looks pretty good and he's uh, still featured almost every single day. Um, you know, and we never could actually, it was really funny because we could never actually say what he did. <laughs> Even though he, was, he ran this gang, this, mobs, this mob, but he would just always have a shipment coming in, <laughs> but we could never say what it was. <laughs> so it was all very vague. Um, and so the great thing about soap, uh, that was another place where the jokes abounded about my, you know, Italian last name. Well, uh, let's give them the mafia story to Anna, because she wished she would know, <laughs> which is, you know, nuts. Um, or, you know, anything that, that we had a kind of stereotype Brooklyn character on, and they would always give her to me to write, you know. This, uh, she was, you know, this sassy Brooklyn lady and her daughter. Um, so it was, you know, there was uh, the Italian thing. Just, I'm kind of glad it doesn't ever go away, um, and that you know I would ne never change my name now for anything. Even though in high school I desperately wanted to be, you know, Sally Reich, uh, the, the the blonde cheerleader, you know. Um, so now it's it's changed, thankfully. Um, does anybody here watch soap? Just curious. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, Sonny. Yes, Sonny. Uh huh. Luke and Laura. But <laughs> you never knew what Luke did. <laughs> but uh, I don't. I don't know it. I was. I only worked on ABC shows for the most. No way! Yeah. Really? Called oh, mm -hmm. God! No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a bit aware of that. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is. The Golden Beautiful is still number one. Wow! 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 No, I have a fr I have a friend from GH who, after she retired, she moved to Siena for a year, and she wrote a book, and they ad they, they advertised it as pr a proud thing that she had been a GH writer for such a long time. A yeah, I guess so. Even though it's still, I mean, my my um, playwright friends were like, "Oh God, you know, you really sold you, you really sold out." You and I was like, "I make a living, and do you know how hard it is to sell out? And I write at least one episode a week, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it was and and the, I don't know if you all were aware that recently my union went on strike." Um, and it was, I realized how fortunate I was that I had a job in soap opera where I got a weekly paycheck as opposed to my friends. I thought it was so cool some of my friends from soap went to Hollywood and they got into the streaming and they were doing nighttime shows and it was just really cool. I thought, oh, they're, that's, what a lot, they're, they're wonderful, they have wonderful lives. No, 
They don't. They weren't being paid nearly as much as they should have been paid. And the work is not steady. You're employed for 13 weeks a year. You can't make any plans. It's total, totally freelancing all the time. And I thought, God, I lucked out. Um, you know, and now I'm back to playwriting. And I did manage to keep my playwriting career afloat while I was still working on the soap, which was not easy, but I did it. Um, and now I'm back to writing odd little plays, one of which Ricky directed recently. Um, about Jeffrey Epstein being reincarnated as a dog. So kind of different from soap opera. <laughs> there were no Italians in that play. No? <laughs> That's probably the only one I've ever written without <laughs> Italians in it. Well, uh, I want to take on that. Um, I want to like to ask Anna, how hard was for you to get to be a writer for television? What was the process? What... You know, you just, I'm sure, you know, there was an internet that you can just respond to an ad. Uh, so what, you know, what did it take for you? And were you afraid or were you concerned that you weren't taken serious, uh, seriously for any reason or, or else? Well, fortunately, at the time, uh, before I started writing for TV, I already had uh, some screenplay success. Nothing was ever made, but I had sold a lot of work in Hollywood. And I also had a very powerful agent, the one who sent me the nightgowns. Um, and um, uh, I also, to anybody here who's considering writing for movies or television, I knew someone who was an executive at ABC. And it really helps to know someone. And um, when I wanted to leave Hollywood, um, uh, she asked if I would be interested in um, becoming part of a program where I had to learn to write soap opera. And I was very resistant, but then I started, I had, my, my parents did not allow us to watch TV during the day, so I had never watched a soap opera before. And I started watching, coincidentally, General Hospital, where they were doing the m most amazing story on AIDS, a guy who was suffering from AIDS. And it was so sensitively done and so beautifully done, I was in tears. I thought it was just gorgeous. And I said, OK, I'll join this program. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do was learn to write this show. And there was a kind of reverse um, discrimination because I had come from Hollywood. I had a playwriting degree from Yale. And that everybody thought that I was not suited for the work. So I had, to re I had to work like 12 times harder than they would say to me, you're too literary. You're too, th don't use these, this big vocabulary in, in, the, in the dialogue or even in wh I, uh, the outlines. Um, they would go, oh, you know, oh, that's Anna. She's, from, you know, she's got that degree. And she's, you know, um, so it was, a little bit of a struggle to prove myself, for sure. Um, my husband, who is here tonight, can tell you that I used to come home weeping um, after the meetings. On, the meetings were on Mondays, and they would come down very hard on me, and probably for good reason. It, I'm not a fast learner, and soap is a very unique genre. Um, and uh, it, being Italian probably had nothing to do with it, except that they thought I'd be good at writing Sonny, um, <laughs> at writing the, the, the gangsters. Um, it just, it was more about uh, needing to kind of keep me in my place or put me in my place uh, so that, you know, I didn't get a, a swelled head or think I was better than anybody else, and I certainly wasn't. I can tell you that. I was terrible. Um, but I got the hang of it eventually. Um, and you said, you said before that um, Men, you were working with many writers who were females in, um, you know, in the team and the squad. But how about the producers? Were the producers female as well, or mostly men? And what was their power on to have like the final words or like to change the story that you you bo oh. you were writing? Okay, most of for the most part. Okay, one reason I didn't get hired on General Hospital at first is because it was a female producer. And she hated me. Um, and she actually said something like to ABC executive, who was my friend, she said, don't ever bring me a writer who's um, thinner than me and younger than me. Um, 
this actually was said by somebody, but it was back in the late 90s. Uh, so um, <laughs> there, was, there was that. And also, she, you know, she said I was too literary. So she didn't hire me on GH, so I came out here to New York, and I worked on a show called One Life to Live, which was on, I think, right before General Hospital. It's, it, it was taken off the air. It went off the air in about 2010 or so, 11, I can't remember. Um, and uh, um, that was a, those were almost all female executive producers, and they have every bit of power as you can imagine. They, they don't like the story. You have to rewrite the entire week that you just turned in. You, it was often chaos with some of these. I mean, th they could be just as megalomaniacal, megalomaniacal as men. Um, they're, they're in charge. They have to get a show out every single day. If, but if they didn't like a story, and a lot of them, I have to confess, could be a bit sexist in terms of n wanting women to be more traditional on the show. Um, wanting it to be more patriarchal. If we tried to do something that was more contemporary, tried to make a statement, we would often be slammed because we would, I, I'm responsible, okay, I worked for all my children for a while. I was a head writer there. I was responsible for the first lesbian kiss in daytime. And, um, okay, I had a writing partner on the show. They fired him and kept me. And. I said, I real, you know, I realized the reason they fired him is because they lost uh, revenue from advertising because of a lesbian kiss uh, and a lesbian relationship that we had developed. So somebody's head had to roll, and it was my writing partners because he he wasn't nearly as agreeable as I am. I'm I'm I know how to play the game. He he's he's very harsh, um, and so this is one moment I'm very proud where they called me to say they were firing my partner, but keeping me on. And I said, no, no, you fire him, I'm going to. And they said, well, we're not firing you. And your contract says that you have to stay on and write for us for another, whatever it was, six months. And I said, I'll hire a lawyer. I don't care. I'm, and they said, you're walking away from the money. If, if you quit. We, we have to pay out your partner's contract, but we don't have to pay out yours if you quit. I said, I don't have kids and I don't shop. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. And that was, you know, if, if nothing else, if you don't keep your integrity, you don't walk away with anything. Um, and he and I are still very good friends, by the way. And he's still very harsh. Uh, <laughs> He just never, you know, you got to be diplomatic. You have to play the game. And he, he wasn't very good at it. But I was, I'm proud of the, the first lesbian kiss. That was, do you know, um, has, uh, you probably, it might be before your time, but there's, there's a very famous soap opera actress named Susan Lucci. Oh, yeah. yeah, from, you know, good girl, a uh, girl from Brooklyn makes good. Um, and she was the mother of the lesbian um, on the show. And the, the daughter's name was Bianca. So my, <laughs> it's just the daughter who was a lesbian, my roots pervade everything. So um, another, another story uh, uh, that I was, I'm very proud of in soap opera, because sometimes you could get something in there. You could get a little piece of yourself in there. And like, like I said, the, the executive producers were really tough, really tough. And I wrote, um, we had a very feminist character on GH, and um, her, she had been living with her boyfriend for a very long time, and suddenly on Valentine's Day, he pops the, will you marry me question. And she's like, wait a minute. Is it, no, we don't do that in this relationship. It's not, that's a patriarchal thing to do. Why should the man ask the woman to marry her? We never discussed marriage. We were fine living, you know, it, just, it doesn't work that way for me. And she, the audience was about, uh, we have a very, very vocal audience. They were about 50-50 on understanding what we were trying to do. That, you know, this tradition of, of a big ring being shoved at somebody and, you know, you're, you're buying, you're essentially buying, uh, you know, your wife. And that's the way this character looked at it. If you watch GH, it was Molly. Um, uh, so, she, and she, uh, 
I thought it was funny that some of the, the audience were like, how dare she do that to TJ? Oh, you know, he, he's so romantic, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we got it, we got that done. And uh, that, and I had one male boss who was, at least the women were honest, like this, the executives were very honest. If they didn't like something, they told you. With the, the male, you never knew where you stood. You felt like you were gonna get fired every single week with him. So that was no fun. He drove, he drove me crazy and he drove everybody else crazy too. Um, I have a question for you. Um, how does, you know, the process, I mean, like the, the, no, in the war room when you guys are like talking about what's gonna be in the next episode or like character development, uh, how does, you know, what are the roles inside the team and who does what? Well, it was, it's truly in a writer's room, and it should be this way in any writer's room, but in ours, it's truly a collaborative effort. No, n I mean, like I said, sometimes they would say to me, oh, you have to write so-and-so because she's the Italian or whatever. But m most of the time, we, we fed off of each other. You would have um, maybe a germ of an idea, and then somebody else would pick up on it. Um, and, or it would spark another idea. It was very, very energetic, very collaborative, with a whole lot of laughs. And so, somehow we would pound out a week of story. Uh, on uh, We would go in on Mondays and Tuesdays. Somehow get a week worth of stories. But uh, some people were more vocal than others, of course. I, I was generally quieter, and they would always, when something was being bandied about, they would often look at me and go, what do you think? And then whatever I thought somehow went. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I liked to listen. Um, and then occasionally, like, I'd go home at night and something would occur to me and I'd write, I'd write to the head writers. Um, and then we'd run with that. But it was, uh, a, there was a, a lot of, um, we, we had a, a, a great time. I really miss my, my, my colleagues in soap opera. And another question I have is, uh, who, you know, if happens, uh, then you guys, you know, when you guys are working as a team, uh, you have uh, a big disagreement. Uh, you know, how do you, how does it get resolved? Well, hmm. sometimes I would say, I can't write that. <laughs> I can't write that the way you want me to write it. And they would say, well, how, and how would you be able to make it work? And what do we have to do to make it work for you as a writer? In soap opera, um, because I was given a lot of latitude, it was OK for me to be able to kind of go off on my own and do what I wanted to do. However, when, I'm writing, when I was writing for movies and theater to an extent, um, For instance, I had a play being produced. I did not like the way it was being produced here in New York. So I, it was in a festival, um, and I said, I, I pulled it. I took it out. I said, I'd rather, not, I'd rather not have it done than to have it done this way. Um, and it happened to me in a uh, theater in San Francisco, too. Same thing. But then they le in San Francisco, they let me change it the way. They let me do what I wanted to do. Also, one time in Hollywood, I was hired to write a script and they wanted it to be really gross and disgusting. It was a remake of a very old chestnut of a movie called The Trouble with Angels. And um, they really wanted like, they wanted like lesbian nuns and lots of sex and it didn't, it wasn't true to the original nature of the, of the piece. So um, that was another job where I, I walked away from it. Um, I, I just said I can't, I can't do this. But in soap opera, honestly, because because it's so much more collaborative, I was able to do what I wanted to do. And you said before that like, you mentioned about the lesbian kiss, and now you know we are in the woke, the woke mom and the woke era. Uh, how do you see uh, you know this movement woke uh, affecting the TV industry or the writing industry today? I don't think that there's anything wrong with woke um, myself. I think it's good for us to be sensitive and aware. Very important. Um, 
but I also think we can tip too far in the other direction. Um, for instance, if you wrote a female character who liked, uh, who was a masochist, that probably wouldn't go over right now um, because nobody wants to see women enjoy being hurt. I think that that's kind of a problem and that that's something that somebody might want to represent um, in a, a TV show or, or whatever. Um, I mean, I don't, how is woke defined right now? Um, I, I always thought of it as, get, tell me. my experience, woke now is more of a derogatory way of referring to any sort of uh, idea of social justice or um, uh, any way that we want to see society reforming in, in that sort of way. I may have a, a biased opinion on that, though. When did it change from what you were talking about to being a bad thing? Or, or encompassing a, a lot. I mean, how does anybody else have ideas about how you define woke? Aware. Aware. Oh. I said aware, just eyes and ears open. Pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening. Don't get distracted by the shiny object. I know it for decades, so I don't know where the movement came from, but I only heard of it like a year or two ago in Florida. Uh huh, in Florida. <laughs> Being the older white guy, it's a subject I stay clear of. Uh, but I think where it affects the writing, like Ricky asked, and you're 100% right, we should be sensitive and we should be well aware. I grew up in the 60s. Nobody in my neighborhood had filter. My father said whatever he wanted about any race. You know, that's the way it was. But where, where there's a problem with me and writing now is, I get that in 2023 we should write this way. What I have a problem with is when I'm told you can't write like that, but that's how they spoke in 1960. We can't change history, you know. So I think people are very fearful with anything. So if you wanted to write something about rock and roll, which your former writing partner was doing, he was told you can't say chicks. Really? It's not 2023. He's talking about 1967. So that's where I think you could have a problem writing, with trying to be aware of everybody's sensitivity and also revising history at the same time. Does anybody here think woke is bad? Whatever it might be. Do you think it's good? I, th I think like with anything else, it depends on like how far you take things. Like anything as an extreme, I think is bad. 
but like I don't think it's necessarily like I was just googling like what the exact like textbook definition of like woke culture is now and it's basically just like what someone over here said earlier it's like awareness of like social injustice and like sensitivity and it's like a movement to like include more people from more backgrounds and more walks of life and I think that's really good but one of my favorite high school teachers had also pointed out because like he's of course in support of that but like also sometimes people get like really like hypersensitive or like focused on the wrong things like with like the oh you can't say that but it's like mm, like we should be respectful of people like and appreciate everyone's like cultures and backgrounds and experiences but like there's also like almost like this like reverse censoring that happens sometimes where it's like exactly you no know, like you, i don't know I, I ran out of words to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, reverse censoring is a really good way to describe it. Because then, you know, you aren't being true to, say, a certain character or, or a certain uh, epic uh, uh, era in our time, you know, when things were different. Like I said, you know, I was in Hollywood without Me Too behind me, and it, there was no wokeness. Like, I can tell you that much. <laughs> so... You know. And off topic, I've never watched General Hospital, but I thought it was really funny when you were like, yeah, the mobster guy's not Italian, but Greek, because I'm actually both. So I was like, oh, oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that works. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> and they named him Sonny. His name is Sonny Corinthos, like Sonny Corleone from The Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the, yeah, I think, you know, there's also, like, I guess something to consider, like, what, what is woke and what is a PC. I mean, I think a PC goes uh, overboard sometimes, and you, as a writer myself, and I think it's, uh, as we know, you know, it depends who you're pitching the project. So if you're pitching the project to a certain company, there are certain things that you can say. If you're pitching the project to another company, th which is a little probably more, uh, you know, flexible, uh, then you are allowed to say more things. So I think it also depends who is your, you know, the person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. and. PC, yeah, can go overboard. Woke, it could go overboard too. It's just about you know, see as a creative, as long as it doesn't affect your creativity as a writer, uh, or it doesn't, imp in, you know, it become an impediment. I think, yeah, to keep it in mind. Well, it does affect creativity in some ways. In that, sometimes I feel like, I, like for instance, I wrote a ten-minute play recently, and I I had a check off the boxes, like, okay, is there, you know, is there some, a character, an ethnic character, is there, um, you know, is, uh, is, is there, um, uh, is, uh, you talked about injustice, would, uh, um, is there something here that speaks a, a, against uh, racial disparity or injustice? I had a little, I had to go through all of this in my head. so. Some writers say that you know limitations make you more creative, and I, in some ways, I, I, I kind of did. It opened me up a little bit to, like, okay, how can I figure out how to make this work, um, you know, as a as a white writer too, you know, without being, uh, if without appropriating somebody else's culture, for instance, you know. And talking still to say on TV, talking about TV, uh, you know, we all have uh, like streaming platforms in the last, uh, you know, probably, I was like like six years, seven years mostly. Um, me before there was only Netflix that you know you can get it from DVD, uh, mail at home. Now they just stopped. I think like last month this e they mailed the last DVD. Oh, yeah. And um, so when you started your career, they were in these you know uh, other channels and. Do you think the TV now, because of the you know um, huge um, huge amount of material is available, uh, is like living a stress test? Uh, meaning like we are running out of good ideas or creativity, and kind of like you know I lo it seems like it looks like to me that you know if Amazon has a show, then net or b vice versa, Netflix has a show that is similar mm -hmm. to that. So that's kind of you know uh, I wouldn't call it cheating, but uh, is that really you know how much the creativity is uh, affected by the streaming platform? Is that TV going through a stress test or not? Well, I think there are two answers. One, one is that I think that streamers, uh, streaming services are reaching a saturation point, which is why they were so desperate to keep from <laughs> to not pay their writers as much as the writers 
deserve um, because they're starting to lose revenue because there's just such a, a huge amount of material out there and they're not, um, the, I don't think that there's enough audience for everything that they have. Um, the other answer is that because streaming services are so hungry for a broader audience, they're likely to askew some little some some show that's not high concept that might not attract a bigger audience. There was a sh there's a show I think it's on HBO called Somebody Somewhere that it's pretty much a you can't really talk can't really say what it's about. It's it, but yet it's it's charming. It's hard hitting. It's it's full of great characters. It takes place in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, very unusual types of people. Um, and a show like that, which I love, I have no idea how it would get made. And f I, have, I have a pilot right now that I can't say in one sentence what it's about, but that's what streamer, streaming services want concept. They want you to be able to describe, you know, oh, you know, um, The Sopranos. It's about, it's about a mob guy who's having a nervous breakdown, you know. Mad Men, it's about an ad, an ad guy who isn't who he says he is. It's easy to pitch. Um, I feel like th this, that streamers, um, streaming services aren't allowing m different, more eccentric writers uh, in. They're not allowing them, they're not giving them a chance. And they're also hiring the same people over and over again who are, of course, they're gonna hire the, the person who did, you know, White Lotus again and again because they, they, it was successful. Um, but they're not the, the writers who are maybe perhaps less experienced or more um, quirky aren't getting a chance. And that, that breaks my heart because there's some good material like this show, Somebody Somewhere, where it's like, I want more shows like that. It was, it's just so fun. I can't, like, it's one of those few where I can't wait for the next season. You know, it's not concepty at all. It's just very character driven. I have another question still on the streaming. Uh, I don't know. I feel as being Italian myself, but living in the States for many years, but I, my family's still there, so I go back and forth. Uh, I think the, uh, the good side of the streaming, especially living in the United States, is that there are many, many more sh foreign shows that are available here than were before. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so it's kind of like an open a world of knowledge about, you know, there we have show from uh, South Korea, from uh, Sweden, um, from, from Italy as well, from South Africa. So there is like, probably the other side of it that we get to choose stuff that is not just made in the US, but is made somewhere else and opens our vision on, uh, on things or like other perspectives on, on how we see life. Uh, I mean, for example, well, for the you know, tremendous tragedy that happened in Israel, you know, there was a show Fauda oh, that you know, a little bit gave us an idea of what's going on and know more about it. What do you think about this kind of internalization of TV uh, thanks or because of the streaming services? And do you think that is going to, in your opinion, in the future, uh, create more international co-production because you mentioned White Lotus, which was shot in yeah. like last last yeah, season last was shot in Italy, mm -hmm. and it created a lot of tourism there. It helped the the region, and so yeah. Do you think there's going to open also more international co-productions or not really? I certainly hope so because I if the show like Fauda so increased my understanding of what goes on there. In fact, the, the show creator was interviewed on CNN yesterday morning to, so that he could bring in a, a more of, a, of a, an explanation of what's going on, because where a lot of us are like, we don't get it, this Palestinian, what's going on? Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a charming show from Sweden, uh, no, Denmark, uh, Seaside Hotel, um, where you, know, you really got the culture watching it. It's, it's so different, you got, I love that, and I hope, you know, as much as I want American writers to work, um, I hope that they do bring in more because I, uh, although they probably get them for really cheap, which is why, that's why they show them. Um, so, because other countries don't have the same 
writers' unions and protections that we have here. Or even, I don't even think the actors have the same protections. Um, so they're probably paying no residuals, no royalties, nothing. So perhaps it will open the door because now that the, now that the streamers, you know, our strike, the writer's strike was settled last week and we got everything we asked for, which is remarkable. But I can tell you that, <laughs> that they're gonna be bringing in more foreign shows <laughs> because of that, because they're gonna have to be paying the writers as much as the writers deserve. Um, and also, before the strike, the, stream, the streaming services would not allow my union leaders to see the ratings. So they, they didn't know how many millions of people were watching the shows, so they had no leverage to say, hey, you know, X amount of people are watching White Lotus, for instance, or White Lotus is, is an exception because it, it has a producer writer as a showrunner, but for instance, a show like like Breaking Bad, I don't know if any of you remember Breaking Bad. Um, they weren't letting uh, us see, um, whereas in Soap Opera we got, we got rating sheets every single week, so you knew if your ratings were up or down. So the writers should be paid commensurate to who's watching the show, to how many people, how big their audience is. Um, and so I say that only as a preface to, they're gonna be bringing in more foreign shows. <laughs> because of that. Now they have to open up their, their ratings to the, to the guild. Um, and I guess also people who are learning languages actually can yeah. practice more. Yes. Can see in like uh, an original language. So uh, I have a couple more questions for you. Uh, one is like, what would something that in your career that you would definitely not do anymore and something that you would definitely do again? I would definitely not flirt with men to get a job anymore. And I, I'm too old for that now anyway. But that's not why I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and something, I did write this down, something I would do again. Oh. Uh, oh. Yeah, I said it already before. Write in a way that would make my parents proud. That's what I do again and again. And, you know, wherever they are. They better be laughing. <laughs> By the way, my, my mother was still alive to see you know, my soap opera. My father had died before I, I went into soap opera. Um, but my mom got to see me on TV win an Emmy. Mm -hmm. And I purposely wore an orange dress, because at that point she was elderly, and I wanted, didn't want to be a sea of, of black. So I wore an orange dress so she could see me on TV. That was back when the, the Emmys the daytime Emmys were used to be televised in prime time, so they're not anymore. And going going back to your craft, like, what are I mean? I know it's it's a huge huge question, but uh, you know I'm sure you can respond like uh, precisely. Is like, what's the different process between writing a, like a, like an episode for you know soap opera or writing a play? Oh gosh. Soap opera is so much easier <laughs> because you have a team behind you and you generally kind of have an idea of where the story's going. Like, are they gonna get together? Is this couple ever gonna get together? I remember um, my husband and I lived right near the World Trade Center during 9-11 and we saw the whole thing unfold from our, our terrace. We were four blocks away. And uh, it, was, it was horrifying, of course. Um, but the w I had to go back to work the next day and our executive producer came into the writer's room and said, we're only gonna be preempted a couple of days, so I expect a full week of episodes from you guys. And the only thing that really spared me from seeing that second plane hit over and over again in my head was, were Todd and Blair going to kiss at the end of my episode? It was a big deal. This was like, it's a fan favorite couple and they had been broken up. Were Todd and Blair going to kiss saved me, whereas my husband over there had to keep seeing the plane hit. Uh, and you know, it took him a lot longer to recover from the trauma that day. Yes? Um, I ended on the near kiss, because it was a Friday. <laughs> um, I think they ended up not kissing on Monday. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we did. You know, we were always looking for the cliffhangers, and we. A lot of people ask, "Do we write character? Do we? Are we each in charge of a character or whatever?" No, we're each in charge of a day, and so it's like a relay race where you know you hand it off to the next person, and you know, 
they couldn't have, you know, if, if Todd and Blair were, for instance, kissing at the end of my day, they wouldn't have been able to pick it up with, you know, a, a slap or whatever. Or maybe it did pick up with a slap. I don't know. But <laughs> who knows? Um, but, uh, but you know the the play writing a play oh, is I'm also is more like constricted when it comes to location and editing. It's so much harder to write a play because mm -hmm. you're I'm completely on my own, and I generally try to write from character so that there's something real in it. It's truthful, not concept. Wiki can tell you the last play I wrote was came from concept because I wanted Jeffrey Epstein to be reincarnated as a dog. That was not the best way to go about writing a play. So, uh, for instance, a little ten minute play that I just wrote came from. Um, from an actual incident that had happened in my life. And so therefore, it, there was truthfulness and the, the couple could react to it in a way that I felt was truthful because I'd been through it. Um, and so uh, also because it's stage, you know, you got to, um, you only have this to work with. You don't have, uh, you can't, and you don't want to do a lot of scene changes because it's really boring to watch scene changes when you're in the theater. D does anybody here like theater, go to theater? couple people. Yeah, sometimes I, during those scene changes, I get uh, very impatient. Um, but th so you ch I try to um, uh, to make things happen quickly because I have no patience. Yes? You were just explaining a uh, concept of re uh, bring reincarnating Jeffrey Epstein as a dog. Uh -huh. <sighs> I don't know my question, but what other animal were you? <laughs> what other considerations besides a dog were you? Uh, were, yeah, and what kind of a dog? Like a King Corso or like a little. Poodle, okay, like okay. A teacup? Just, just so you know, the dog was played by my husband here. He was very good. He was excellent. Oh, and so the play occurred? Yeah, yeah, it had a little production in uh, the summer. Now I'm more intrigued to know. <laughs> and it came out of a, the idea, a friend of mine who's a, who I used to work with in soap um, said to me um, that my husband looked, before he grew a beard and grew his hair long, before shutdown, he looked like Jeffrey Epstein. Dead ringer, okay. Yeah, he so said, why don't you write a play for him about Jeffrey Epstein? And it came out as Jeffrey Epstein as a dog. <laughs> okay, and uh, spoiler alert, at the end of the play, the dog is, hangs himself. Okay, and comes back as a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> Can we watch this? Can we read it? See it? How do we access? I'm trying it? to get. Is I'm trying streaming? to get it into a one act festival in the that happens in the spring. I think. Can I ask you a question? Is it a screen? You wrote the. I wrote the play. You wrote the play, and you did the acting. And Ricky directed it. And, Ricky and there were two. It? There were two other actresses in it. Where's, where's the screen? <laughs> how, do, how do we get to see it? Um, I have a copy of it. I have a, I, I have a video or whatever it's called. Is it on YouTube? Give, give, give the, uh, the um, I'll, send I'll send it to you. It is I'd on love you, to. It is on YouTube. Okay. Um, actually, Anita put it on. One of the actresses put it on YouTube. Fantastic. It's what is it called? <laughs> it, it's well, called... Well hung. <laughs> well hung. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see that um, leaving soap opera, I kind of cut loose and started to do my own. I, got, I went a little crazy. So um, I went back to my roots as a playwright, where I was thought of as a uh, you know, kind of eccentric playwright um, with a lot of Italians in my plays. Yeah. So a um, couple of last two questions I have for you uh, is, uh, first of all, which and what do you think of the AI? How is going to be the AI in uh, you know, affect the the writing. I mean, the writers mostly. Uh. Well, it was a big problem. Okay, I had my eyes open when I went to a union meeting before the strike, and uh, a writer got up and said that a studio had generated a um, an AI version of a best-selling novel, had done, had done, turned it AI turned it into a screenplay, and she had been hired to do a rewrite. Now, when you do a rewrite in Hollywood, it's half your fee, okay? Half of what you would get if you were commissioned to write a, a, an original story. So they were already trying to save money by having AI generate a script from a novel. Uh, we fought for and won uh, 
the, the, they're not allowed to use AI to generate scripts. Uh, but they're going to get around it. I am sure there will be a, a way around it. I have no doubt. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of frightening. I, I, I taught some uh, creative writing this summer, and my students were passionately opposed to AI because they, they're right. It has no heart. It can pretend to have a heart, but it's, you know, it's culled from, ever, it's not original. And you know, it's, that material is not allowed to be copyrighted because it's not original. Um, what do you, I'm curious, what do you guys think of AI? Do you use it for anything? Uh, as a, uh, a guy with many friends who are getting into writing careers and who was kind of like backseat following the strikes all the time, I, uh, I can't stand it. It drives me nuts and all the companies outright came out and said that they don't want to pay their writers, they don't want to give them actual working rights. It was just nuts. It's pandemonium. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think it's, it, I mean, uh, also, the stuff that AI puts out, there's no way to, no other way to put it than just crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's usually not good at all. Um, but it, it's, it just sucks seeing uh how we can replace people in their jobs, this stuff that they're passionate about. Um, you know, writing to, to do that takes a lot of passion. I should know. I would like to become a writer, but I don't think I have enough passion for it, so I'm kind of just, I haven't really gone down the road of it. Um, but like my friends, you know, having to worry about their futures and if they could even keep going down this career path or whether they should switch or about, you know, friends or family members that they had that were writers and could possibly lose their apartments mm -hmm. because they weren't getting paid. It's, yes, exactly. It is just disgusting, and it, I, I, I have a real uh, hatred for that stuff now as a result of it. Well, the writers, when, when I went to the pre-strike uh, meeting, I really didn't realize how much of a threat it was until these writers all got up and started talking about it. I was like, well, where, where have I been? This is nuts. This is nuts. Uh, and, and the fact that there is no beating heart behind it is, you know, again, like I say, Hollywood is soulless. They'll have no problem trying to find a way to get, to, to keep real writers from, from uh, being paid and generating something wonderful that comes from themselves. So, but it's scary. I wish I brought along one of my friends uh, who is not only a writer, but also it's, uh, Italian American. I'm sure he would have had a free, uh, what is it, he would have loved to just go off right now, come up to the mic and probably vent everything that he was going through the last few months. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, for no, sure. I wish I, I wish I brought him, but yeah. And now, and now the actors, my husband's union is on strike for similar because they can use AI-generated uh, images of the actors taking, culling them from the work the actors have already done. So, for instance, my, you know, my, my husband could, his, his image could be taken and used in a, you know, in a porn movie, for instance, or something, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and they are fighting for that, and con the, the talks broke down yesterday, so I don't, I don't know where they're getting, you know what's going to happen with that. But it's, it's all about AI at this point, not even more than the money. Um, the writers considered AI the biggest threat. Yeah, I think I saw somewhere, I read somewhere there, they're shooting the first movie just okay. written completely by the AI. Oh, God. And so I guess it would be interesting to see what it is. And the last question I have for you, Anna, um, is what advice would you give to, no, student that would like to become a writer? Um, first of all, write as much as possible, even though I don't love writing. I hate when I sit down and I have to write. But then uh, it's, it's hard. It is really hard to confront that, uh, that blank screen. And then somehow, you know, I'll put a, I'll set a very small goal for myself and then it gets, you know, there is no muse. There is no magic to writing. It's hard work. I could liken it to factory work. You just keep going over it. You just keep working at it until it somehow takes a life of its own. It takes shape. 
Um, that's, so that's my first is write even though you hate it and would rather go at the floorboards with a toothbrush to make them clean than, than write, which is what I would rather do. Um, two, uh, try to maintain your integrity in your work. Like Ricky asked me before, you know, have I walked away from stuff? Have I had, you know, problems in the room with soap opera? I try very hard to keep some truth to myself and my beliefs uh, in every, everything that I write. Um, it's tempting to want to do uh, the high concepty thing, like, like Jeffrey Epstein as a dog. That wasn't my most truthful play. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so I um, try to write from your heart. That's all, and that then you'll maintain your integrity. And when somebody tells you to change it, even if they've given you money, try to argue not to change it, or try try to sway them in a different direction. So, um, oh, and third, very practical. Uh, network, know people, get to know people. You never know who's gonna you could, who who might know somebody who wants who wants your work. If if you know you, you have something that you think is a commercial property, try, it's hard to get it's hard to get it to the right people, but just keep you know emailing and and uh, being charming. <laughs> and when I'm I, now, I want to like leave the you know if anybody has questions you know regarding like you know the craft anything you know please you know stand up and go to the mic and uh, Anna will be here like after you know after the panel for f for a few minutes you know if you guys want to approach and have questions uh, you know ask whatever advice things like that so if you have any further questions uh, well I got a question which was uh, what uh what are all your own thoughts about AI I'm assuming oh, now um, okay, I wasn't speaking to them like the whole time. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, what are your all your in depth thoughts about AI? Uh, I, 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 I just said that I I think yeah. a human being needs. Uh, we're writers for ages and ages and ages. Uh, human beings have told their stories themselves. Computers haven't told their stories. Human beings have. And I think it's really important that we keep doing that. Uh, and AI has its uses in terms of like, okay, we use a thesaurus online. I use a thesaurus to, to try and you know sort of open up my mind to some new word. That's using AI, but it's not generating content. <laughs> it's not, it's not telling a story. Um, I think it's. I, I think we have to fight it as much as possible. I really do, even against all odds. I, I told my husband recently that I'm almost happy to be a little bit older now because I think that the future is not looking very good for artists. Yeah, yeah no, I, I worry about my friends a lot and their careers and how this is going to go in the future for them, but mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah. Any questions? Anybody else? I just want to make this comment about the business of uh, the soaps, uh, and if you know this, that when I was a child, my mother, before she went back to work, uh, would be at home, and at a certain point in the day, you know, things had to stop. All of the housework had to stop, and she said, "I have to go watch my stories, my my stories." And the, all of the Italian women that I knew referred to them as the stories, yeah. you know, and even in Italian. Then when I started researching Italian-American culture and reading Italian-American memoirs, I realized other mothers were doing the same thing. They never referred to them by the actual name of the show. And what you said rang a bell in the sense that, and how difficult this is to do, that human beings, since like when we were first sitting around campfires, you know, on the plains of Africa becoming human beings, we were telling stories to ourselves, right? And it's like such a human impetus that I'm not sure AI, as you said, because it has no heart, would be able to do that. You know, but my question is, in in your playwriting, because in the soap opera, obviously you're constrained by the characters that you have, and they have certain characters they can only work in certain ways. 
Well, in your playwriting, you're free to create the characters that you like. So have you created Italian or Italian-American characters? And in what sense, you know, have they come alive for you? Oh, have you used, like, your parents, your family, your history? Yeah, I was just talking before about my first sort of big play uh, called uh, Strega. And it was very much based on my family and my grandmother, who was from Italy, and her, you know, her recalcitrance about changing, about becoming American, about, uh, and my grandmother would watch soap opera, and she spoke very, very little English, and she really didn't want to learn English. But she, okay, she knew how to say this. She'd be sitting there by the TV, and she'd go, "This a very, 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 very bad gal." Yes. <laughs> Um, and so I wrote, I, I, I could write my parents forever. I wrote a pilot that in, uh, th they, were, they were unique and, and honestly straddling those two worlds, strad straddling Italy and America. It uh, was, and like I said, being in Virginia, desperate to assimilate. And then suddenly the godfather changed everything. He's like, we're Italians. <laughs> you know? Uh, well, thank you very much. It was really an extraordinary uh, talk. Uh, I want to leave the last word to the students, though, in case yeah. they have a, a question, comment. Anyone else from the audience? Well, then, on behalf of everyone, thank you, Anna, very much, and thank you, Professor Costa. Thank you, thank, thank you, you. Professor Pugliese. Thank, thank you for, for everybody me. for putting this one together.